Welcome everyone, this is Sherry Hawk, your Member Education Manager, and I am happy to be facilitating today's webinar, Credentialing Changes in 2020, presented by John Kettner, uh, Credentialing Manager at RevCycle Partners. We also have Paul on the line. Uh, both of them will be doing this presentation today. Uh, RevCycle Partners provides revenue cycle management ser services to the eye care industry, including insurance billing, credentialing, and patient eligibility services. They are a PECA partner, and they provide our members with uh, new RevCycle Partners. Customers will receive a coupon for one free credentialing application after signing up for billing or eligibility services, and PECA members that are currently RevCycle Partner customers will receive a, co a coupon for one free credentialing application as well. So a great partner for PECA to have. We are very happy to have them on board today for the hidden complexities of credentialing. Um, this is something that the members asked for, and so we're very happy that RevCycle Partners could join us today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know we have muted your audio to delete any background noise but you may submit your questions via the questions panel and we will get those answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, you will receive an email after this session with the survey. Please, please fill that out. Your opinion matters and we'd like to hear how we're doing out here. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and we will provide that on the website generally by tomorrow. We try to do that within 24 hours, 48 at the most. Uh, just also, any doctors on the line, don't miss out this Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time. Paul Chouse will be presenting Diabetes for 2020. So we're really excited to have Paul on, uh, Paul Chouse on again this year to give us our update. Uh, so that'll be fantastic. Um, and that will also be recorded and placed on the website in case you miss it. And so now I would just like to introduce John Kettner of RevCycle Partners to present a little lecture on the complexities of credentialing. John? Or Paul? Uh, yes, uh, Sherry, thanks. This is Paul Harchie uh, from RevCycle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, sorry about that uh, handoff uh, there. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'd like to thank Sherry and the PECA team for uh, setting us up and, and coordinating us. We know December is a busy time for all of your practices and I uh, appreciate you guys taking some time to, to, to spend it with us on this credentialing topic. Uh, as Sherry said, our, our, pre our presenter today is going to be John Kettner. John runs our credentialing team uh, at RevCycle Partners, uh, is our uh, resident expert on the topic. Uh, and uh, as Sherry said, we'd love to have you submit questions along the way. It's always good to get uh, kind of real world, real practice questions. Uh, it helps make the content a little bit more uh, exciting. Um, and with that, we'll get going. Before we dig into the, the weeds on the, on the credentialing topics and really get down into it, um, I thought we'd start with, you know, talking about the, the, the signs that a practice, you know, may see uh that that kind of gives an indication that there may be some underlying credentialing issues things that that, that you know kind of give you an indication of uh that your credentialing might be slipping so so john what, what are your thoughts what are the what are the canaries in the coal mine if you will on uh on uh, credentialing what what is a practice going to see first before they they run into it um the the couple of things they're going to see first before they run into any issues is they're going to um, all of a sudden stop getting paid by the insurances uh, would be the first one um, and the the other big reason is or i'm sorry the other big sign is if they're paid out of network uh, sometimes insurances will go from in network to out of network with a provider um, and that's usually a sign if there's a switch that something happened with your credentialing so I know we're going to get into it in, in more detail, but but what are some of the you know kind of basic reasons a practice might get into the situation where you know before they were being paid in network and all of a sudden they're being paid out of network or not 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 paid at all? What are the what are the, the basic things that happen along the way? Oftentimes it's actually the, um, the insurance will send out a revalidation notice and it will be missed by the office, um, such as you know it might go to the post office. Uh, and somebody will just kind of throw it on the side in a, in a pile to look at later and it gets missed completely. Um, sometimes the insurance companies will actually email it to somebody, but that email address is a staff member who's maybe no longer working at the practice or they use the personal email and, and since they're not there any longer, nobody has access to it. So they don't 
and they don't forward it on because they're no longer employed, so they probably don't care. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we've seen a couple of times when insurance will actually go back and look at an application for whatever reason, and something was missing on the application that they that they themselves didn't catch. Uh, you know, so they'll they'll come back and say, "Oh, we're gonna not." Actually, they won't even tell you we're going to be out, take you out of network. They'll just do it sometimes. Interesting. Um, and the list goes on from there. Okay, sounds good. Sounds like a lot of communication related type things, uh, notices and that, that type of stuff. So with that kind of as background, uh, we, we'd like to present, uh, John's going to present, there's five hidden complexities because uh, under, underlying the complexity is our those potentials for errors, which uh, which drive the, uh, you know, drive the ultimate issues of, of claims being denied. So... Um, uh, complexion number one is is the application itself. So, John, tell us tell us about and, and I'm sure I suspect we have a mix of people on the on the in the audience or on the webinar. You know, some that are experts in credentialing and some but some that maybe just got assigned it, uh, and so it's kind of a new topic for them. So uh, we'll we'll probably cover this pretty broadly then. Um, so, John, tell us about the nature of these applications and and kind of the inherent complexity and just the application process itself. Um, one of the biggest uh, complexities is that you actually have to make sure you have the correct application. Many times there's individual applications, group applications. Um, sometimes the insurances have special forms just for demographic updates. Um, if, you're, if, you, if your doctor gets married, um, there's a name change form. Um, you want to make sure that you use the correct one before you actually start the process because it's absolutely no fun for anyone to submit an application just to find out that uh, you used the wrong one. And unfortunately, you can't always rely on the insurance company to tell you the right form right away. Sometimes it takes several calls uh, because not all the uh, people you talk to at the insurance company will even know the right answers. Um, a couple, another issue that uh, can create a problem is you have to actually be credentialed with all the sub plans. Uh, so basically, a good example is Blue Cross Blue Shield. They'll have a commercial plan, a Medicare plan, and a Medicaid plan. Just because you take Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't mean you take every one of those. You don't take all the Medicare, all the Medicaid, or commercial. You have to actually apply for it. Um, uh, you have to when you submit your application you have to mark that you would like medicare and you'd like blue cross medicaid but to take those you have to make sure you have your medicare number and your medicaid number because the insurance companies will want that Got it. Um, so basically you know make sure you understand the prerequisites and then that will help with the application process uh, and also just know that sometimes insurance plans can add plans that um at the last minute that you may not be aware of. So um, that's another complexity. Sometimes there's a plan you didn't even know about. How about, how about, hey, John, can you, can you kind of translate those complexities or that application process into maybe a, a, a real world example, you know, somebody that you've worked with or, or you know, heard about after the fact, uh, you know, and, and, and the complexity that, the, 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 you know, the results are, uh, that occurred in the practice because of it? Sure. Um, so I have a perfect example for Medicaid. Um, it's an established practice, decided to hire a doctor right out of school. Um, and since this doctor was right out of school, the office actually assumed the doctor was not credentialed with any insurances at all, uh, including Medicaid. Uh, so they submitted the application. They were really good about all their follow-up with the insurance company. Everything was moving around smoothly. And then about four months after they started, they were told the doctor's application was actually approved and it was linked to all the office's locations. Um, so when the doctor started seeing patients, all seemed, all seemed good until the first EOB arrived from Medicare about a month later, and it was denying all the claims for that doctor. Uh, turns out that the doctor, when the office submitted the application, the doctor hadn't updated their CAQH or their NPPES to change it from being a student and to a billing provider. And so even though the application said it was a billing provider, the insurance didn't care because the CAQH and NPPES wasn't updated. Um, and so finally it was able, they, once the doctor updated that, they were able to submit corrections, but that again delayed it probably another two or three months after that. 
So you just want to make sure that everything, you, you know, you're on the right page with everything. Uh, sounds like lots of I's and lots of D's, lots of T's to be crossed. Uh, you kind of alluded to your example was about a new grad. So, so uh, in a new grad situation, um, when, when can a practice start that process for the, for the, the new doc? Once the doctor has their um, OD license and liability insurance, they can generally start the process. Um, they, the insurances want to at least see those two things before they'll uh, take a look at the application. Sounds good. Let's move on to uh, complexity number two that we'll address. And, um, uh, and the next one would be is, is closed network. So John, tell us about you know the whole concept of a closed network when when practices might run into it and and what what they can do when they do run into them sure the closed network um, is when the insurance companies won't credential any more providers for that specialty um, and they can close a network for any reason at all however the biggest reason that we usually find is because they feel they have enough doctors in the network and they don't want or need any more and the tricky thing about a closed network is it can actually be closed by state, county, or even a specific city. So you want to make sure that you um, follow up specifically why the insurance uh, closed that network. So how, how, how often do uh, you know networks reopen? I mean, what's what's if if uh, practice is blocked by a network being closed, what what would you recommend they do? Um, what I would recommend is uh, they would want to check the insurance company at least quarterly um, to make sure to see if the network has reopened. Uh, the insurance companies can reopen at any time. Some of them do open first quarter of each year. And so that's um, one of the reasons we say check quarterly. Otherwise, if you have the time to check more frequently, such as monthly, I would highly recommend that because sometimes insurance companies will actually do a first come first serve. So if you get your application and as soon as it opened, the network opened, you have a better chance of being approved for the network. Are there any ways to like appeal a closed network um, that, that would allow a doc to get in? You can absolutely appeal a network. Um, one of the things um, that you want to make sure you appeal with is something that makes you stand out. Like, do you speak a language? Um, do you, you know, for example, can you do sign language, something like that, something that makes you stand out from the insurance, from other doctors. Um, a perfect example, we actually had a doctor in Colorado who uh, was Korean and most of her clients spoke uh, Korean. However, the insurance didn't want to add this doctor to the network. And we appealed based on the fact that she spoke a language that none of the other doctors in the area did. Uh, and because of that, and that we were able to make her stand out, we were able to get her onto the network. Almost gives up the, uh, the payer a, a reason to put them in on the panel because it's going to serve more of their patients, huh? Exactly. Got it. All right, that sounds good. Uh, next complexity, tracking, tracking and documenting. This, this topic, when I uh, hear about it, always reminds me of, of tax preparation. Uh, about about kind of archiving information. So, John, how, how important is the documentation, and what, what types of things should a practice archive around the credentialing topic? Um, documentation is very important. Um, one, some of the things you definitely want to archive is that you want to make sure you archive any letters, any communication from the uh, insurance companies that specifically say. Um, uh, so I apologize. Any insur any letters or correspondence from the insurance companies that I'll, um, say, hey, you're on the network now, um, anything that gives any kind of start dates. Um, you also want to make sure that you keep your uh, copy of your license, your liability insurance. If you um, are a owner of the practice, you want to keep the IRS letter, the CP 575 they send you. Many times, um, even with a new doctor, the insurance companies may ask for that. Um, and if you don't have all the correct information, the documentation, then the insurance companies, they'll either stop the process where it starts or they'll, they won't even start it as they're reviewing it. Um, one thing I will throw out there, uh, insurance thing, other things that the insurances are really, really picky about is that nothing expires within 30 days of the applications. 
So for example, if you submit an application on 12-1, but your OD license expires on 12-28, they will not process the application at all. They won't even, they, they'll look at it and go, nope, not going to happen. You need to submit a new one. And in some cases, it requires a whole new um, application instead of just resubmitting the, the new license. So if, there, if there's all this information and documentation and correspondence to, to track and document, do you have any recommendations uh, for the practices on, you know, you know, where they should either physically or electronically store that information? I would personally recommend that it's stored in a secure area. Uh, if it's if it's a paper document, I would definitely recommend like a locked file cabinet or someplace that's very secure. Um, if it's if it's going to be electronic, you're going to want to store it uh, maybe on a on a flash drive or uh, in the cloud in a password protected file, or you could even store it in your PMS system if they have that system that kind of set up. Um, whatever it is, you want to make sure that it's someplace secure because of all the information that is on some of those documents that you do have to provide to the insurance companies. You don't want that stuff getting out there for everybody to look at. Got it. Pretty, pretty typical these days for, for the security side. So complexity number four, Medicaid. So all, uh, <laughs> although everybody is muted, I, I, I swear I heard a bunch of groans on the other side of the uh, other side of the webinar so john the, the government payer applications you know generally seem to be more difficult um you know, what, what should a practice expect when dealing with with medicaid applications uh the short re the short answer is a really bad headache uh, but the long answer is you want to make sure that you understand your medicaid your state medicaid process uh, because if you don't understand how to do it you will probably flounder. Um, and part of the problem is each state is different with what they want. So for example, Louisiana wants a paper application, but Georgia Medicaid wants you to do an application on their website. Uh, and then the other issue is if you're doing the application and you call for help to the Medicaid's, a lot of times they don't know the answer or they can't help you because of company policy. It's amazing how many insurances say that they won't help the doctors fill out the application. So it's good. Any any changes in Medicaid for 2020? Any any credentialing issues going forward there? Uh, the biggest issue is actually state specific to North Carolina, uh, and and that is just that the North Carolina had originally granted its contract for the MCOs to six different insurance companies, and it was going to be done by February 1st. However, they've actually now changed it to be put on hold indefinitely. Hmm. And, and they don't know when they're going to be uh, coming, coming, uh, allowing new, uh, the MCOs to take over. Um, and then a good way to also is to make sure you sign up for your state plan newsletters that tell you all that information. Sometimes they give you notice about changes and sometimes they don't. So just, you know, make sure you read whatever you get from them. Got it. Sounds good. And, and the last topic we want to hit or last complexity we want to hit is uh, uh, kind of getting lost in the shuffle. Re really the, uh, the, the follow-up process that's required in, in the credentialing world. What can you tell us about that, John? Um, the, what I would suggest is you want to make sure you follow up every 30 days after the application has been submitted. Um, many times the insurance companies will tell you either on the application or when you call, don't bother calling us uh, sooner than 45 or 60 days. However, um, if you do call earlier, sometimes you can find out if there are any issues that have arisen, um, even including that they don't have the application. Because if you have to, if you wait that 45 or 60 days and then call them and they say we don't even have it, then you are now back to square one and have to start over, wait the 45 to 60 days. So again, even though they tell you that, um, I, I would definitely suggest calling sooner than, um, or calling every 30 days. Uh, many times there is also frustration because you have to leave messages or send emails that are not returned. Um, you, so one thing I would suggest is if you have to keep doing that, find a supervisor that you can send the email to and the correspondence to, or 
leave a message for and and hopefully that will get you somewhere got it so you know with all the follow-up and the details uh you know required for the applications and the and the you know i dotting and t crossing do, do, do you have a, a recommendation you know for a practice on, on how they should cover the credentialing let's say from a staff responsibility it, it, this isn't like a you, you don't see this as a full-time jo job for most practices do you for most practices it is not it's a it's a job that the doctor sometimes can handle or one of the staff members um, what i would recommend you know is to have one person though who is dedicated some of the time to making sure the credential is done and kept up to date one point of contact for the insurance companies to send revalidations or things like that um, part of the issues the more people who are working on uh, on the credentialing issue the more potential there is for errors because one staff member may think that um, the other staff members dealing with it and vice versa and then it never happens and that's another way that the uh, you, you're all of a sudden out of network because you missed the deadlines because there was confusion. How, how about on the other side, uh, you, when you're dealing with the, the, the payers, is there any recommendations on, you know, who, who to talk to when chasing down, you know, issues or status or any, any tips on the, on the payer side? Yeah, definitely. Um, when you call, call and make sure you're talking to the credentialing department. Um, usually it's a whole separate department when you're in the phone tree. Uh, because if you talk to a regular customer service person, they often won't know what's going on. They won't know the status of the credentialing. And sometimes, even though you're approved, they their system isn't updated for, you know, it can be up to 20 days before the system is updated for them. So you want to make sure you're talking to the credentialing department who can give you the most up-to-date and current information. Sounds good, John. Thanks. Um, so, Sherry, I think we're ready, uh, almost ready for the, uh, the, the Q&A side. So I'll, I'll encourage uh, uh, folks to type into their go to webinar panel uh, questions for us on the on the anything to do with credentialing topic. And we're, we'll do our best to, to cover them or I should say John will do his best to cover them. Um, but, you know, while those are coming in, we'd like to do the uh, one minute commercial if we could on uh, the RevCycle partner credentialing offerings. We, we have, you know, two distinct offerings uh, in our credentialing area. And so, John, maybe just give a real quick uh, elevator pitch on the two um, uh, offerings we have while while, while Sherry's collating some questions. Sure. Um, the the custom project section um, is is where we would do. It's a one time project where you would, if you hire a new doc, we would go ahead and add them to your group, or if you're moving or adding a new location, we would do that for you. You know, all of a sudden you say, hey, I want to be on Blue Cross Blue Shield. We would get, we would attempt to get the office and or doctors added to that. Um, anything like that, re-credentialing, you know, if, if you get a letter and you want don't want to take care of it, don't have time, you can send it to us and we'll take care of it for you. Um, same thing with the maintenance services. Um, we, we would do CAQH management, we would do all your revalidations. Um, the nice thing is included with the monthly fee is the demographic updates that we would do for you. We would actually keep track of when things are due and say, hey, your license is expiring next month. So, you know, we would, we would want you to have time to get that done. Um, and there, we even offer a portal to secure, where you can secure your documentation, where you can sign in at any time to see the status of anything if you you know if you're going hey what's how much longer before this expires well you can sign in and we'll tell you um so those are just a couple of the features of both the programs we offer great thanks so sherry i'll turn it back to you if you want to start see if there's any questions that are popping up absolutely and thank you john and paul um great great questions and great answers I'm um, not always ones we want to hear, but <laughs> think about these things before we get into the new year. Uh, we do have one question up. Uh, what are some reasons the networks will be closed? Um, uh, most of the re time, the reason, most of the time the networks are going to be closed because they feel that they have enough uh, providers, specialties, uh, I should say, for that region, be it the county, the state, the city. Uh, and so uh, that's when they're going to close the networks most of the time. All right. And next question. 
We currently use RevCycle for some of these things. How do I find out what we have contracted with you? Uh, I'll take that one. You can reach out to either me directly, or uh, you can, uh, you know, if you're if you're working with a billing rep uh, on our billing services team, you feel free to contact them, or just reach out to uh, out to me, or it's you know you can reach out to sales. A any way to f find us, and and uh, we'll 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 let you know what we're uh, what you're signed up for, and and how how that uh, program's working. And and I'll be happy to send out an email with uh, their contact information in case you have additional questions after the webinar or need assistance with your current uh, account with RevCycle. I, um, I threw a phone number and website up there, Sherry, just so they can, awesome. they can have that to that. So. Perfect. And if you didn't get that there, we'll be sure to get that to you other places. Um, also, next question. We started the credentialing process with Medicare August 28th, and the application is still sitting in the finalizing process. How long is this process normally? Medicare will not give any information. They tell you to check the portal. Um, Medicare generally, um, I, we usually get our Medicares done in 60 to 90 days. Um, some, It's usually actually quicker. One thing you can do is um, look on the state-specific Medicare website, uh, Novitas, uh, CGS, anything like that. And sometimes that will give you an actual phone number to call a person and they'll tell you why it's taking so long or um, what's going on. And sometimes you just gotta be a little more forceful with them and say, I checked the website and it's not moved in you know, two months or whatever. Um, I do know that Florida Medicare is way behind. Their average is 120 days right now. Wow. That'll make you a little bit nervous. Yes. <laughs> so any other questions, there is a questions panel. Just type those in and we will be sure to get them answered. So I see a question here, Sherry. I'll take one or, or ask one. If a, if a doctor is switching from a, 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 an old practice to our practice, what are, what are the steps involved to get him credentialed? Great question. Perfect. Sorry about that. The first thing that I would recommend is to update the CAQH to have the new location added uh, because once you start notifying the insurance companies, they'll start pulling the doctor's CAQH. And if that new location isn't in there, a lot of times they'll just stop right there and they won't continue the process until it's updated. And sometimes they'll notify you and sometimes they won't. Um, once that's complete, then you're going to want to make sure to reach out to the insurance companies and find out what they actually need to do to do a demographic update. Uh, sometimes some insurances will just say, send us a letter that says, you know, Dr. Smith is on our network now, or I'm sorry, in our group. And some you have to do a full new application with certain sections filled out. So, so definitely reach out to them and find out what you need to do. Um, once you get the answer, send all the information in and start the follow-up process. Paul? Sherry, any more questions on your side? <laughs> <laughs> Were you muted? <laughs> I did, I did, I did. <laughs> um, Paul, did you see any other questions coming over? Uh, I have one kind of kind of detailed one here. Uh, Jamie, you can handle this one. If, if you open a business with one sole owner, do you have to get a group NPI or can you use an, in, or can you use an individual NPI? Um, it, it actually depends on how your business is registered with the IRS. If you're registered as a sole proprietor, then you could just use your um, individual NPI uh, and your tax ID because you and the business are considered one entity. Um, so you don't need a separate group NPI at that point, but anything other than a sole proprietorship and you definitely need a group NPI. Got it. I think that's all I see on my side, Sherry. Any more on yours? No, I don't. Um, so we have another option. If you'd like to just talk to us, you could raise your hand and we'd be happy to unmute you as long as you're unmuted on your side. Um, we're happy to just put you online for your question or you can continue to try to type a question in real quickly to the questions panel. I find with this kind of um, presentation that it, sometimes it takes some soaking in and going back to what's going on 
and and then you hit oh i should have asked that question so it's always great that we have the opportunity to send you questions after the fact um, again i will send an email out uh, with their information so you can reach out to them or you can always uh, send out a question to education at pekka.com and we'll make sure the right person gets that question again uh, we do have another one that just came in I've been credentialing for a practice 40 plus years. Wow, I don't have questions, but can only give some good advice. Keep your CH, CAQH updated by reattesting every 90 days. Any thoughts on that, guys? That's actually a great suggestion, and I would just add on to that and um, maybe even do it every 60 days, uh, because sometimes the insurance companies start the process early you won't even know that they're revalidating you um, and they'll start pulling your CAQH. And if it hasn't been attested um, recently, they'll they'll stop the process or they'll send you a, hey, we're gonna slow you down. Oh, yeah, wow. that's a great suggestion. Make sure you're always attested. Fantastic. And thank you for submitting that, Rosie. Yeah, absolutely. All right. A little bit, one more minute for questions. If you have anything, again, um, I, we will be sending out a survey, uh, their contact information. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Paul Chouse will be talking on diabetes in 2020 this Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, also great news, the annual meeting is in process of planning. We are super excited about this year's schedule. Uh, more will be coming out. I believe registration will be opening up in January. So be sure to keep your eye on emails for that announcement because that fills up so quickly. Uh, another question came in. Can a practice use one group NPI for two different tax IDs? It's, I want to say yes, they can, um, but I will admit that sometimes the insurances get a little snippy about that. So I would recommend you actually do two group, if you have two tax IDs, do two separate group NPIs. Good advice. It's better to be safe than sorry in the long run. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Paul or John, do you want to say anything more before we close the session? I'll just thank you for uh, hosting us, Sherry, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to work with PECA and be a PECA partner. We will see uh, everyone at the uh, annual meeting, and is it is it May, April or May? I can never remember. It actually is April 30th through May 2nd. So it's, it's both April and May. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, we, we, we appreciate the opportunity to, to work with the PECA organization. And if anyone has, uh, you know, deeper questions on the credentialing or want to talk something over with uh, John, you know, just reach out to us and, and we'll get you connected in. Thanks, Sherry. Sounds great. Thank and you. Everybody, and everybody have a great holiday. You too. Bye-bye now. <laughs>